Uh, and this is a um, budget presentation meeting. So this is a, a meeting where the Board of Finance gets to hear from certain large departments and services within the town uh, regarding their budget, what services they provide. We put out a little bit of framework uh, in terms of some things I thought the board and the town would like to hear. I uh, We are recording this video and yes, we'll make it available to anybody who wants to look back and see what department presented. And personally, I find this quite interesting. Every time we do it, I, I learn something each, each time and I just thank everybody for the time we put in it. And I think it's very worthwhile having it even recorded helps because town council can see it and um, anybody in the public could could come in and look and, and see a little bit behind the scenes about all the things the departments are doing. Even when I frame the questions, I framed them in such a way where the departments have a chance to get a little attention or give a little insight into what they do that people may not be aware of. So I just thank everybody and let's get started with uh, the library and the Barnes Museum. Okay, very good. John, I'll start off. Just want to make sure you hear me clearly. I hear you, but it's not loud. Uh, is that okay. on my end or? I don't no, because I, I don't, it's not very loud on my end either. Okay, I'll try to talk really loud then. It's, it's, that's working. <laughs> you worry, that's good. I'm leaning into my machine, so hopefully this will be better. So my name is Mary Baker. I know many of you. I'm currently the chair of the Southern Public Library and Barnes Museum Board of Directors. I reside at 50 Brain Tree Drive here in town. And I'm here tonight with Assistant Library Director Sandy DeCoco, DeCico. And so, excuse me, Sandy. So she has been serving as the interim library director in the absence of Christy Sadowski. And so Sandy has been serving since January and doing a wonderful job for the town. And so we heard your questions, we heard your questions, John. And we'd like to open our discussion, discussion by showing the board and the public a video. For those who watch on the recording, so the video is a minute and a half. Um, I hope that's okay. I'm gonna see this if this works, and it gives a little insight to something unique that the library does. So Amelia had given me uh, rights to share, so I am going to try that now, and share my Google. So let me know when you see that, and I'm going to press play. Um, and hopefully you're going to hear the sound. Welcome to the Southington Public Library. The library has a unique offer from patrons and people entrance. Today, we will be showing you some of the more unusual items that are circulating right now. One of the first items are the ER house. In virtual reality, letting one encounter fair item you can borrow is something called a merge key. This item allows you to hold holograms in an augmented reality. It can also be used with VR goggles. Our games for three weeks. In addition to these items, a telescope kit is also available for you to discover the stars. The last items that we will be discussing are our Fitbits. We have 20 Fitbits, and these devices help to track one's activity for the day. Come down this summer to check out these cool items and so much more. Hope to see you soon. So I'll stop sharing. Hopefully that will work. Um, Sandy did text me and say it's a little lagging, so apologize. For it, was, it wasn't too bad, though, Mary. Okay. So that was Sandy's voiceover. We're really proud of the services the library offers and the residents. Um, just we're really looking for them to be aware of all that they have at their, um, you know, for their use. So in the spring, it's been a unique year, as you all know, the library was closed for in-person visits and the staff quickly reacted by establishing curbside pickup and providing excellent virtual programming. Lockers were set up outside the entrance for after hours pickup and a homebound delivery program was established. And during this past year, 
The children's department had more programs than the previous year and attendance for adult programs grew by 23%, unbelievably. So digital circulation, obviously because of the um, pandemic increased, that was by about 20% and we had an overall 50% increase in people registering for library cards. So the current hours of the library are Monday through Friday, nine to 11 and one to five, and then Saturdays from nine to five. There are so many virtual programs and the make and take kits are extremely popular. This April, we'll be celebrating National Library Week, but we're gonna do it for the entire month here in Southington. Uh, so look for special programming. Your Southington Library provides many programs and services to residents of all ages for the personal growth. And your library is really our way to explore, all of the residents' way to explore the world without leaving town. So Sandy will add a little bit of what our happenings have been like in the last year. Thank you, Mary. Um, yep, yeah, just to highlight, um, you know, as we know, everything changed overnight. Um, one night we were working our regular job. The next we had to basically reinvent what we were doing for the community from scratch, um, changing all of our most basic procedures. Um, as Mary mentioned, we began offering on-demand contactless pickup for materials as well as, as the after-hours pickup lockers. Um, we started the homebound delivery program. Um, we have about uh, 15 residents taking advantage of that now. I hope it'll continue to grow. Um, one of my homebound patrons is turning 100 on Friday. So I'm, I, and she just got a card from the library and she called me today to thank us for what a beautiful card. Um, everybody wrote her a message. Um, and that's something I did want to touch on, you know, while we can talk about all of the resources the library offers, something unique that I wanted to share was about our amazing staff. Um, the staff has truly done an amazing job um, just re recreating every single thing that we do. Um, and one of the biggest things that we heard during our closure to the public was that the patrons really missed that personal human connection. Um, the library really is um, such a, a central place for a lot of people. And, you know, coming and interacting with us at, as the staff really sometimes is their only interaction with others or going to the grocery store. Um, so, you know, our staff forms relationships with these people, um, lending an ear when they need, uh, you know, a mini therapy session or suggesting a book when they, you know, and they know a patron would enjoy it. Um, and my staff started asking, could they se start sending handwritten cards out to patrons who they know, uh, you know, may not have internet access and, and wouldn't have any outside contact. They also asked if they could start calling patrons at home and just checking in on them and seeing how they were doing. Um, you know, and that the joy from the other end of the line was palpable. Um, the amount of, of people who were just so grateful to hear us and hear our voices during this time where so many people were isolated. Um, this really, the human connection in the community of the library is what makes us so special. Um, the library is not only surviving, we're thriving, um, and we're helping the rest of the community thrive as well, as best as we can. Um, you know, the library has been and always will be a place that is open and welcoming to everyone uh, and is consistently in flux. Uh, times change, but the library always will change with them. And we will always remain relevant because there is no other place on earth that provides what a public library can. Uh, we will always adapt and always change to meet the needs of our community as that's that's what we're here to do. Um, so I just I wanted to highlight that unique part of our our service and really the central part, you know, the central goal is is community and how we reinvented that in a time where people couldn't get together in person. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. We're really proud of the staff. The whole entire, I speak from the entire uh, board when I say that uh, they've really stepped up through this time. So um, I went to the budget. You know, we've worked as a board to approve um, what the director Sadowski had presented us back in December. And we, Sandy and I met with uh, Mark Shoda. And so we feel this is um, what we um, need for funding. Um, it's bare bones, we feel. The increases, as you know, are based on the labor with the, contra the contract ratification. Um, we did have programming costs that was down, um, you know, say good 15% because some program is moving to virtual. Um, and then building maintenance, we're grateful for the work that the engineering department's been doing at the library to have that plow uh, work happen more effectively. So, um, 
we'll go, we'll wait for your questions before we go on to the barn. So, you know, with that, did you have any questions for Sandy or myself about the budget or about the um, opening that we had on our program and then offerings? Yes, I do. I do. Is it okay to speak? Yes, yeah, go Susan, ahead. Susan. Yeah, go for it. Um, this is Sue Zoni. Um, is, is there any chance that there will be any acclimations made for tutoring options? I do tutoring out of the New Britain Library, and they have been able to put in six foot long tables with some plexiglass in the middle, and we wear our masks, and I'm still able to meet with my um, international students there. Um, it's far easier for me and them to meet in Southington. Are there any options in the planning for instances like that? Uh, Mary, I can answer to that a little bit. Um, so, you know, that was obviously a big, a big hit. Um, as, as you know, as a tutor, you, you've seen how busy the building can be with filled with tutors. Um, so displacing all of them was something that we definitely considered. Um, you know, and also, as you know, the space that we have to accommodate is is definitely lacking. Um, you know, our program room is filled with items, chairs, tables that were removed from all around. The cafe area has been transformed into a quarantine area for our materials. We are quarantining items. Any item that comes through our doors, we're quarantining for a minimum of five days. Um, that we're following the CDC research and the American Library Association guidelines recommends uh, quarantining items for that period of time. So, unfortunately, it is taking up such a large portion of our space. The only open space that we have at the moment is, I would say we would probably be able to fit two tables upstairs, one in the teen space, one in the former maker area um, over by where the quiet study rooms um, are located, which has been transformed into an office space for one of our staff right now. Um, you know, in the next phases, as things are, are the capacities are increasing and, you know, as we're getting different um, information from the health department and we, uh, <coughs> that, is a, that is definitely a high priority. Uh, for me, we're, we get a lot of people and there's nowhere for them to go. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have a meeting spaces. So I, I will certainly keep thinking about that and how we can best implement um, that and do it safely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've got a, a, a couple of questions. Um, is there any learnings that you've had from running uh, essentially largely remotely? Uh, you know, during the last uh, several months that would be factored into the forthcoming budget? Is there any way you're going to change the way you do business or is there any thought of that? Or have you learned anything that would make you do that? Or is it all going to just, all going to just um, not, not be thrown away, but you know what I mean? Not relevant going forward. You know, I would say n not necessarily, um, uh, uh, with the budget is as how the budget is concerned, but there's definitely okay. procedures and, and things that we've put into place uh, as that are conveniences for our patrons and our community that we want to, we want to keep in place, even when things go back to normal, um, you know, the contactless material pick up people enjoy the after hours lockers for people who can't get there during our normal hours. Um, very simple for them to arrange that pickup and our take and make kits have been so popular as well. A lot of people can't make it to a program on a weeknight at 6 p.m., but they want to. Um, this way, they're able to do it at their leisure and we're able to reach a lot more people than our usual groups that we typically get. Um, so we, we've definitely learned a lot of new processes and, um, you know, I'm really glad we were able to get the homebound contactless homebound program started. Um, being close to the public during the summer uh, and the spring was it was a great time for us to get that started. It gave us the time to really, you know, work on the procedures and, and get people on board for it. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's been there's been a lot of things we've changed that will will absolutely keep up, um, you know, as far as programming is concerned. We would love to get back to in-person programming once that is safe to do so. That's, you know, the in-person connection is there's nothing to replace that. It's, um, but yeah, I, I definitely, there's a lot of things that we've learned that we will continue to do. Okay, second question is, um, how's the heating system doing? <laughs> do, do we anticipate any emergencies which we'll have to find? 
Well, uh, luckily with that increase in our maintenance line, um, I think that's going to give us a little bit of a cushion. Um, okay. And we've also been uh, getting the help uh, from the Board of Ed. Th uh, thank you, Mark, um, to help come in. So some of the staff from over there have been helping to offset those costs and kind of help our custodian fix what they can, um, which has been excellent. Yeah. So, okay. So you think you're okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, it's fingers crossed, fingers okay. crossed. It'll make it through another winter. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Last question. Did you used to work in Ber Berlin library? I did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I recognize the name. <laughs> my, my wife used, my wife used to work there. So. Oh, oh, uh, Mindy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. So, uh, Tony, to add to your question on the programming, one thing is that we have saved costs with travel for the speakers. So, this past week, the library ran programs where there was a speaker that offered it from Colorado. And it's from, so, we're not paying people to travel. We're not, you know, hosting. Yep. The cost savings has been great. Like, those, those types of programs would typically cost us anywhere from 150 to $300, but virtually they'll be sometimes free and up to $75. So it's definitely, definitely cost savings for us. John, any more questions on the regular budget? Or we could speak to the barns. Actually, John, can I make a comment on this? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, you're going to have a reoccurring theme um, with the uh, with the two things that uh, you see the increases in this particular budget. Number one is the salaries, and as Amelia always likes to phrase it, it's a triple whammy uh, since most of the employees, in fact, everyone uh, but the director and the assistant director uh, belong to a union, uh, which we just approved the contract. It goes back till July 1, 2019. So you understand uh, that it's a triple whammy. You've got, uh, you've got almost, well, three years of, uh, of raises within theirs. So that's why you see a larger number. You're going to see that throughout the presentation. And as Sandy touched upon it, uh, we did keep a larger, um, obviously, maintenance line in here. The reason why it's reduced, um, and once again, you're going to see this as a reoccurring theme. The reason why it looks reduced to you is because, um, as I explained to you, there's going to be two laborers hired by the Public Works Division, and they're going to be taking over all our outbuildings. So uh, you're going to see all the outbuildings with reduction in maintenance. That's because all the landscaping and plowing uh, starting July 1. Um, will be taken over internally by staff. So even though Sandy is this correct, we are keeping a larger number. It's showing a, a reduction only because of that situation. So those are the two clarifications on this budget. Other than that, as uh, Mary and Sandy has told you, this is this one's pretty bare bones. Yeah, Mark, it's um, it's it, it, it's in the budget. There's a little explanation of that. Mm -hmm. So that's great. if you're good to move to the barns it's the same story the one point we'll make is that we did increase office supplies because we needed to purchase archival boxes and just as a side note on the barns we have the roofing project that's over the veranda that's going on you might be seeing work in the next month start on that that's not related to the budget did you all have questions for sandy or myself on the barns Just one high level question. How, how much, what does it do for the community in having the Barnes Museum and having it opened and having it staffed? What, what are the benefits? How much usage do we get? Is it increasing, decreasing? We would have a different answer if it weren't the pandemic, but Sandy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's yes, we've been we've been closed for quite some time and our uh, curator has been out on leave. So that's also added to the closure. Um, but and now the veranda project, so that's going to continue. So this is it's not been a great, uh, great time for the museum, but um, the museum is such a treasure. Um, you know, I don't I haven't spent a lot of time at the barns just because I, you know, I, I have a lot of going on at the library, but whenever i'm at the barns it is it you you cannot go in there and not learn something about the town where you live um the people that get the tours especially if the um assistant curator bonnie is giving them it it, it truly the knowledge that she has 
and the Barnes family who collected and held on to everything for years. I mean, any anything you could possibly it's it's just like walking into a history book, but there's real people behind it and they are such a it's, they leave such a legacy now, uh, you know, starting our library and I, you know, I would encourage you if you've never been to go as soon as we open it. It's truly amazing, um, and we, I have been contacted during our closure by a lot of other museums. We're hoping to get, you know, working with them. Um, we also provide, you know, space for um, for a lot of different events. Um, they would host uh, volunteer groups that would come over and assist in projects. So the Stellar program at the high school would come over and help Bonnie with some projects. Um, they also um, have the space available for weddings and events outside. Um, but the museum is truly just, it, it's its such an interesting piece of history that we had a plan before COVID. A, we're ready to market the heck out of this place and really transform it and bring it to now um, and make it relevant to the community because if people knew what was in there and what an experience they would get, uh, you know, you wouldn't even think to ask that kind of question. It's uh, it is an amazing place, um, and I I can't wait for the for it to reopen and have us get started on all of that and and really start bringing in new people, new programs, and some excitement to that place. So Bonnie did a great job of virtual programming at the start of the pandemic, and that was mm -hmm. really w well received. The other thing is, I think the Barnes provides almost a cultural corridor for the town right on Route 10 there. So you have mm -hmm. the Barnes, the Cultural Arts Center, and then the library. So if we were to market um, just all those activities and then highlight the museum for the grounds, I think we could go a long ways with that mm -hmm. in the time where we can meet in person. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll talk to Lou Perilla about that. He's up next. That's it. So, um, John, if I could, just one last comment. Um, we didn't speak about the referendum, but the board intends, uh, we have recently through Johan Kelleher, who is the chair of our planning committee, met again as a committee because it's been the year before um, the pandemic that we had um, the plan. And we're actively seeking input from counselors, uh, finance members, Ed is on the committee right now. Tony visited us, us last week. So we're really getting around the plan that will be best received by the town residents and within a constrained budget, but yet provide um, the space and the need for the next generation. So our um, timeline is such that we would hope by May, we would have a conversation um, before then to allow council to vote, to move a referendum forward for November. So you certainly can touch base with me after this evening. And if you have any questions about um, what is happening there, but we are gonna be meeting with the council in an upcoming month and give you some more detail. Thanks for briefing us on that. Okay, uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, we'll now call upon economic, uh, Economic development. Thanks, Mary and Sandy. Appreciate it. Have Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hi, Lou. Good evening. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lou Perillo, economic development. As you can see from uh, the budget request, we're requesting 3.8% increase from the previous year. Uh, as the town manager uh, stated, the wages are up from retroactive pay. Um, overtime pay is basically in case I have a contractual obligation. Same with longevity. Contracted services are for initiating some projects. We have several projects um, in the works right now. Uh, we're hoping not to use town funds for them. We try to use private money from developers as best we can. But uh, at times we can't. You, you know, we have to use town money. I mean, it's tough to do no money down deals uh, as things move forward. Our promotions account, as we had indicated last year, we are trying to be proactive to help uh, support our small businesses and promote our town. Um, we did say it was going to be a long term initiative. So that is in the budget again. Office supplies uh, are in there as well. We reduced them a little bit as well as or the travel rather we reduced. Um, and again, we have a carry forward of contracted services. 
Most of that is for the Beaton and Corbin project. We uh, started it. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, it shut down the courts to uh, foreclosure actions. We still have to go through the foreclosure on the property to do further uh, remediation activities. What we did to date was uh, not necessarily remediation other than the removal of the above ground storage tank and the fluids in them, the tank, as well as the underground storage tank, clearing the lot and debris removal that we could do on site um, before we went too far. The reason we started it is we had deadlines to the grants. We have um, eight, uh, we have $400,000 in a grant from DECD, and we have $400,000 low interest loan um, through the developer, through the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments. They had deadlines of December 31st and September 30th, respectively. Um, we were able to get an extension on those, but at the time we were moving and uh, motivating to get the work done, we were uncertain as to the extension. So we made the decision to start and be proactive with as much work as we can, especially the removal of the underground storage tank because we did not know the status of it and as well as the above ground because we were concerned that it would uh, further exacerbate any leakage. Um, and then uh, that's pretty much our budget moving forward. And I'm here for any questions. I think uh, you want to know what our office does at one point, but I'm here for questions. <clears throat> hey, Liz, Kevin. Um, did we have many hey, businesses go out of business uh, from last year? Um, that's a great question. I think we did extremely well. Um, the reports nationally are about 17 to 20 percent of restaurants went out of business. We did suffer some losses um, and we had some movement moving around. But for the most part, you know, it's easy to say relatively unscathed. But if you own that business, I mean, we feel for them. And the other aspect that you can't measure is um the severity of the pain that's involved with the losses so the ppp loans really helped uh, a tremendous amount um you know but for there were some losses you know i mean one of our main concern or temporary shutdowns that we're concerned might be permanent but i'll be quite frank with you no one really is excited to call you up and say they're they're going out of business usually you, you don't learn of it that way How did you manage to get that property across from the Manhattan? Um, there seems to be activity there. Last time I went by, I was curious because I thought it would be blight for, for, for quite a while. And yet it happened, you know, it seemed to have happened during the pandemic. Uh, we can't take credit for that, sir. That oh, was okay. the landlord. <laughs> we had shown right. it several times um, and uh, Airsoft went in there. Uh, like I said, we had significant interest from a number of companies, oh, okay. but um, there's only so much you could do with private ownership and the owner is a real nice guy, yeah. their timing. Okay. Okay. But we're happy because that area can be really strong. Hey, you know, I think there's only a former beauty salon that's vacant. Other than that, mm -hmm. everything's occupied. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a, a technical question. The, um, the increase is on is on the uh, original budget number from last year, not the revised budget number. Um, well, why is that? Is it because those one time, are these just one time costs, the contracted services? Well, for the contracted services, we have anticipated several things. One, we did $75,000 for Beaton and Corbin over two years. Um, if we needed additional funds from the way it was going, we wanted to have a reserve. And the other thing was, I am currently working on at least two industrial parks. Um, oftentimes, you need funding as a catalyst. So you might need testing um, to see the wherewithal uh, of the site itself. Um, I'm proud to say that in the next three months or so, three to six months, we should be making public about a 20 acre site and perhaps the 60 acre site. We have indications of interest of the 20 acre site being fully 
um, sold, if you will, or pre-sold. So we might not need any of those funds. We looked at the site for a town industrial park. Um, the cost wasn't anything I felt comfortable bringing to this board or to the town council. Um, so we were able to take the indications of interest that we had on individual lots, show it to a developer who um, is going to move forward with it. Okay. It's just not you know, for me to say publicly much further detail until yeah, the contracts are all in yeah, Okay. Lou, were you surprised by our grand list list growth or did you, you know, based upon your your radar and knowledge kind of assume we would we would see that kind of growth? That's a great question. Uh, I'm pleased by the growth. You never really know. I mean, you could, especially during a reval, um, we see things that are coming on the table, but the valuations, especially throughout the pandemic, given the disruption in retail, um, it's, it's interesting to know. I mean, in other areas, especially areas that might have a mall, some of the values could have been challenged. But if you look at what has been going on over the last probably six years or so, you could see um, solid investment. For example, getting the Hartford insurance buildings filled. Um, the multiplier effect of having 1,500 jobs there helps keep that corridor strong. Matter of fact, uh, I think it's Longhorn Steakhouse that's having an opening this evening. Um, it's hard because you don't know, and they were ready to open last year per se, but um, the pandemic does stall certain businesses and it shifts other businesses such as retail. So um, it's interesting to see how the repurposing of commercial sites are going, but we're very fortunate as a town. Um, the property across from the Oak Hill Cemetery has been sold. It's approved for three medical office buildings. Mm -hmm. We have indications of interest along commercial, um, residential, uh, multi, uh, multi-family residential as far as apartments that are market rate. So we have the ability to attract well over a hundred million dollars in the next two or three years. Uh, with tax abatements, I think you'll see a delayed impact, but the multiplier effect is still there. So, you know, we're, we're very pleased with 1%. It's not easy, especially when you look at the compounding over the last 10 years as revenues generate, it's, you know, harder to move the needle, if you will. One of the things we're most pleased with is if you look back about 20 years ago, the percentage of commercial and industrial and vacant land to residential. Given our town's boom in residential development, we've been able to keep um, that statistic uh, stable. So we're consistent in growing our industrial base and commercial base along with our residential percentage wise. I always thought that managing the balance was the answer. Um, exactly. To the, uh, Teachers union always meets with candidates and asks different questions about the support of the, the budget as presented. And one of the answers I've always given was, we're, we're, if we keep our community balanced and we have the right balance between the industrial, the commercial, the residential, the 55 and older, if we can keep every, everything happy, everything working, everything balanced, then we're in the best position to fund the, the government and its purposes. When something gets lopsided, whatever it might be, too much industrial, not enough red, when something goes out of whack is when we all start to feel the problem. Or if we become dependent on, on uh, the top taxpayers, we got to look at the list if, if something happens there. And so I, I really think it all comes down to balance. And I always think of your department as a department that kind of does what it does, but is, is actively managing the balance. I appreciate that because uh, in the last few presentations we gave, um, everyone thinks that we want to develop the whole town and that's far from the truth. If you look at some of our strengths and what we focus on, it is that balance. Um, if you look at the former landfill on DePaulo Drive when we brought in Supreme Forest products, 
you know, we were paying 22,000 to, to, for leaf disposal. Now we're not paying that number. We're utilizing a landfill that no one wants to be near. They're putting things on top of it. Um, more importantly, the services that are rendered from there make it cheaper for our town services, for our residents. So before you might have to truck off stumps a distance and you'd pay for it. Now they, they basically chew up the stumps and repurpose it. If you look at um, another building that we're very proud of is the Juniper Lighting Building uh, on Water Street. That was a $2 million investment. That building, if it was not repurposed into this lighting center, um, when American Standard closed, it had issues. Um, it was part of another property that had some contamination concerns. The way it was cut needed some assistance from planning and zoning uh, in our town attorney. It's in a floodway, so it had some issues there. That could have led to blight. Instead, we have a gentleman who came in from New York, purchased it for over 700000 put another $1.3 in. I went by it today, and there's over 35 cars in the driveway, um, in the parking lot area. So these now, are the what things. Do, what's, what's in it? Juniper Lighting. It's an ultra high end lighting manufacturer. And we brought them in from Brooklyn. And, and, and what's really great is your balance statement is profound in the sense that it really does take the whole town. Juniper got um, assistance from the town in a tax abatement through the town council. Um, planning and zoning, land use staff went out of their way uh, to try to facilitate the deal. Um, the building department was very thorough, but very good in helping them work the process along. We have a, an economic development strike committee that was uh, very helpful. So, you know, literally A to Z from the town attorney or the assessors to zoning, um, we get a lot of help and, and we get a lot of help from our elected officials and volunteers as well. So that balance is holistic throughout the whole town. Um, and, and that's important, you know, like when we tried for the Curtis Street not to be residentially developed, um, you know, we like that piece for inventory. If we could replace heavy industrial um, or industrial, we'd gladly place it, but nobody seems to want it in their backyard. We like to repurpose properties. So one of the reasons when you look at Beaton and Corbin, that was upside down by over $1.1 million dollars to get that repurposed, saved a virgin piece of property or a greenfield site from being developed. The Greenway Commons, um, we have a couple of people still interested in that project. You know, that has an exterior retail build of over $70 million. Um, just the cleanup so far that has been spent to date uh, was at least a $3 million grant, a million and a half dollar uh, low interest loan, and then the developer's money. When you talk about blight, repurposing 14 acres in the heart of our downtown, if those buildings were not removed, even though we still have some things to manage on site, that blight could have spread throughout our downtown area. And when you compound that with the difficulties of the pandemic, it could have been very challenging. So as much as people want to see something built there sooner than we're able to deliver, um, just having those buildings down is a tremendous effort. Uh, if you look at where Chick-fil-A is, that was Forestville Industrial Plating. That was a $700,000 cleanup. So we're doing well when it comes to balance. We're trying to keep the franchise and the commercial activity in our high traffic districts without hurting our small businesses um, in other areas. And, and it seems like, a, you know, the town is doing really well. Our, our residents are really supporting these small businesses. I think it's wonderful. I don't have much of a forum to to speak and I hope people watch these uh, um, presentations at some point, but during this pandemic, one of my messages is get out and if you can, if you feel safe and you you're, you want to be mobile, get out and support these businesses. Go out, go to a restaurant. If you're in the position, leave a big tip because now is when um, these businesses need you. My favorite little hot dog place in Waterbury, Frankie's Hot Dogs, always had, had a sign. <laughs> And the sign says, come in and eat or we'll both starve. And I pointed to that slogan, which I remembered over the years, but it never resonated with me more than during a pandemic. Because if we don't go to these places as a community, we don't spend our money. And that's if we have it. I, I certainly feel for anybody who's been economically disadvantaged, out of work, 
Um, <coughs> it's horrible. But if we have money and we're not impacted, which a lot of people are still in a good financial position, if they feel comfortable, get out, buy something, spend something, um, go to a restaurant, order takeout, whatever you're comfortable with. But this is a time we have to support these businesses. Because some of them, they may look like they're the same when you're driving around, but inside, you know, their their financials are, are suffering, they're laying off people, um, and they need our help. Agreed. And to further your balance, if I could put in a plug for the uh, Southington Country Club, I mean, there's a, a situation where, I mean, that's about balance. That's 114 homes that could be ready to go. Um, and we talk about, we could put 114 homes spread throughout town, but in that concentrated effort in that area to lose a golf course, um, that's facilitating that balance that you were talking about. That's why we're supportive of, uh, you know, hopefully that referendum passing. Okay. Uh, speaking of uh, speaking of balance, Lou, um, the, you know, obviously the the massive retailers, you know, <laughs> probably probably won't be uh, expanding, you know, after everything goes online, and you know, you will have niche retailers like you mentioned, um, you know, the smaller ones. But th does that affect our balance? Um, does that affect the balance you were talking about? Um, you know, the I think I mean, we're okay. 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 Yeah, one of the things um, a long time ago, Pratt and Whitney was up for being a retail. They wanted to demolish it and put a super Walmart in a McDonald's. Um, I think BJ's connected to it and we were against it. Um, and it wasn't that we were against retail, but there were several other reasons. The industrial had much more value to us, um, quite frankly, we didn't feel Queen Street could handle it north of the I-84 bridge. There was nowhere to expand um, that area. And then that would cause congestion and local people avoid congestion. So uh, we don't really have the block, um, the, the large scale retail that some of these other places have per se. We have quite a bit on, on Queen Street, but we're not looking at like the Meriden Mall the Waterbury Brass Mill Centers, um, they're going to be repurposed. I think the Meriden Mall is going to be a medical office. Um, you're going to see distribution centers, Amazon. You know, the, right now, the big initiative is the last mile delivery services and whatnot. Um, you're going to see some of these things turn into housing or their own housing, office, live, work, play areas because housing is, uh, you, you know, getting some funding and whatnot. But for Southington, I think, again, we're well balanced. No one company represents more than 2% of our uh, tax revenue generation. And I think that's our utility companies. Um, you know, it seems like our our employment is strong over at the Hartford Insurance buildings or former Hartford Insurance, even <laughs> though some folks like Webster Bank are working from home. Um, you know, when, when they come back, it'll be strong, you know, with the traffic counts again. Okay. Yeah, thanks. If I may, if I may, it's one of the concerns that I have about West Street, though. Um, well, that's yeah, the retailers on West Street. I was really talking about because <laughs> obviously yeah. we're not going to see that too much. Yeah, I future. think we're going to have to revisit our regulations, especially for the Sepco property. Um, you're not going to see. I know it was the intent of our regulations to attract a lifestyle type center, and there's just so much retail space that you are not going to find a developer who's going to risk that. You could go to an area that's being vacated in West Hartford um, that has a proven track record before you're gonna build new and try to rent at that rate. I hope that answered your question, sir. Yeah, thanks, Lou. appreciate it. Sure. Anything else? Nope, Lou, thanks for everything you do to help bring <laughs> businesses into Southington because it seems like a very desirable Thank you, sir. And same thing, Louis from Ed. Um, I see your work. I'm out there a lot, and uh, and and the main thing is their keepers. They're staying, and that's what counts. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, have a good evening. Excellent. Okay, we're running a little bit early, and that's good as long as everybody's ready. Uh, next group up is community services. I see Janet's on. Is there anybody else, or are we ready to go, Janet?
Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, Janet. Okay. Can you, okay. So I want to tell you a little bit about community services, just to remind people that we are a food pantry that's open 40 hours a week. In the, in the calendar year 2020, we distributed over three quarters of a million meals. And we, we started this year Farm to Families through the Curtis um, Foundation, Robinson. And with that, we distributed 58,483 meals. Um, Southington Community Services continues to be a resource to enroll Southington residents in state and federal programs. We're there for emergency needs with assistance with utilities, rent, mortgage, medical needs, fire, homelessness. Um, and when we help with those, it's not with tax money, it's with donated money. And I think that's really important. I believe we were the only community service in the state of Connecticut that during um, COVID-19 did not stop any of our holiday programs. And that's thanks to the citizens in um, in the police department, the fire department, we delivered 172 book bags to um, Southington students. We delivered um, 208 Easter baskets to children. We delivered um, 520 baskets to Southington families. That was 1,087 individuals. We delivered 579 food baskets at Christmas, which was 1,251 individuals. And from the armory, we had volunteers deliver 751 families gifts, which um, was equal to 1,239 individuals. And that was pretty impressive because most of the towns decided not to do it or to do it on a very small scale. We decided the people that were gonna apply, we were gonna make sure they got everything they always got. And it was only because of the people in this community that we were able to do that. Um, Another thing that I think that was very important is we strive to do something as simple as if someone calls looking up for a phone number or someone could just come in and get a piece of paper and a letter and we would read it and explain it to them. And the reason that's so important is during this, um, these times when people all of a sudden for the first time felt they needed help, I think that the staff and volunteers had made people feel very comfortable. So it's been very, um, easy for people to come into the office because we are seeing new people now. Um, we work with the community all the time. The food pantry would not be open 40 hours a week. And I think we're the food pantry that's open um, the most hours in all of Connecticut without the volunteers that we have. The holiday programs we did only happen because of the generosity of businesses, civic groups, churches, families, individuals. Um, can't thank them enough. A few facts that you know people might not realize about community services is the office is available 24/7 through fire, building, any other department, um, police, and we've received a couple calls this year. It's been a little busier than normal. And the director of community services is also the fair housing officer and the relocation officer. And sometimes in Connecticut, that's actually a separate department. And the relocation um, act. In Connecticut, we've been a little busy with that, and we have three different landlords we're working with. Um, but the staff and the volunteers were doing a great job with that. I also and want what to say that, that, what does that mean, relocation officer? Oh, so the Relocation Act um, was formed in the 70s. So if a town, whether it's building or um, department or any department, Close the house, condemns the house. The town now is responsible to pay whoever is living there six months rent, the following six months until they find a place. They're also entitled to a $4,000 check when this is over. Um, then the town will put a lien on the property owner's uh, home or the building that they were in. The app was supposed to be, it was. It was designed because the landlords are really responsible, but a lot of landlords just didn't pay. So if a landlord chooses to pay up front, a lien would never go on their property. Not all landlords are gonna do that. Um, we are working with a landlord that is doing it. He's an absolutely fantastic landlord to work with, but not everybody's gonna do that. Cause it could be very expensive. If you think 
you know, you have three different buildings that were shut down. And so for six months, you have to pay, you know, their living expenses, basically. Um, we've had it in the past, but it's only been a weekend or it was something very simple. Now, it's just we have three of them um, since the middle of December. And just to let you know, so a town, those are the basic things that a town is responsible for. A town can add other things. They can say, okay, uh, we want to, um, let's say, provide food for the people for the six months. The town is something can we, we actually do with the um, state of Connecticut uh, says that we have to do. We do a few extra things on our own. I mean, during the holidays, we had quite a few families out. We made sure they, they all got adopted and we dropped stuff off. Um, we brought them some food from the food pantry, but we're doing exactly what the state tells us we're doing. And it's, it's something I think is going to happen more often now. So, if, you know, if you have any other questions and you want to give me a call, I can actually talk to you about how expensive this could be. You know. Thank you. Um, so I, I met with the town manager in his office and he's very aware of what's going on. And, um, you know, so we're do the town is doing a great job. We're doing what we're supposed to do and that's what's important. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about during COVID, when it started, we were one of the, we were, we're one of the apartments that never closed. Not only did we not close, we decided when people came in for the food pantry, we were gonna give them more than they normally got because of the things that were happening in their lives. We also, and I think this is important to know, we gave extra special things. During the two weeks um, around Mother's Day, all we gave Mother's Day gifts out. The two weeks around Father's Day, we gave Father's Day gifts out. The Osterman Foundation and Top Supermarket donated gift cards. So for one month, everyone that came in for their food got a $10 gift card to Top Supermarket. The Unico Club went out and bought $25 gift cards to local restaurants so that when, for two to three weeks when people came in, they'd get a $25 gift certificate to a restaurant. At the time, there wasn't eating inside, but it was all to-go meals. So um, I think that we, you know, community services really made a difference during that mm -hmm. first three months of COVID. They got extra stuff. Um, during that time, well, recently we just applied for two grants and we received them. One is an emer uh, emergency generator for the building. And that's very important because we run commercial refrigerators and freezers and that was paid for um, through a, a grant. Um, the generator arrived today. We're just waiting for the building permit to go through and they're gonna start that. We received another grant to produce two videos. And I think that's important. We're gonna put them on our website um, and on Facebook explaining what services we provide, how to apply for the services, how long it would take, um, how long the food pantry is open, what you need to do to get food. Um, that's something that the manager and I sat down and talked with that he thought it would be very important. And so we applied and we just received the funding and we're gonna be starting that next month. Um, also during COVID, we learned to be much more creative when working with residents by using email, text, in phone conversations. Um, we can see less people in the office um, by doing it by emails. We can email the forms, they can email them back, people that can do that. This morning, I had someone who wasn't sure how to email, so he texted me all the information from his phone to my phone. Um, he actually ended up coming in, but he didn't have to. Um, so we, we've learned to do a lot of different things and it's actually worked out very well. We actually renovated the office during when COVID hit to make it safe for both um, staff, volunteers, and people coming in. And what we did at no cost to the town, and I think this is important, we installed automatic light switches to save energy and to avoid people putting the light switches on and off. We replaced almost all our um, storage and workspace shelving with um, racks that have we're on wheels so that we can clean under them a lot better. We realize how dirty things can get when you don't move them. We installed partitions and curtains at all the um, staff desks. We installed automatic faucets in both bathrooms. We installed touch-free soap dispensers in both bathrooms. 
we removed all the rugs and replaced them with a very easy to clean and sanitize flooring. Um, we have ordered, and it should come in soon, is an awning that's going to go over the garage door. We, what we realized when we were paying more attention to the bay during this is when our volunteers were getting food from all the grocery stores in the morning, and if it was raining or snowing, they would be soaking wet. So we've actually ordered that awning, and that should be, as soon as the weather's a little bit better, that's going to be installed. We actually, we also bought a lock box, and we installed that on the outside of the building. So. Um, we learned a lot of things and we're going to continue to do a lot of the things we do now. I think that people find it easier sometimes not to come in the building. And it's worked out very well for us. Janet, who's on, who's on, who do you have as staff and, and who do you have, how many volunteers do you have? What is it? What does the staffing look like down there? It had to change. Um, we had a hundred volunteers. We have three full time staff and we have a seasonal $14 an hour. Um, we couldn't have as much staff for social distancing. So we have less, I, well, not staff volunteers. We have less volunteers in the food pantry and we have to space them apart. Um, right now, I would say we are still, staff would be 30% to 70% volunteers. Um, is there, the is there people who, who kind of show up every day or some come a few times a week or they, do they yeah, come for certain to, programs? How do they, how do the volunteers work? Oh, we have to have them scheduled because, you know, for the food pantry, we have to have a minimum of three people in at all times. So everybody has a schedule. So a typical person will do a four hour schedule once a week that comes in. And if they take time off, we, we have to, we have to know in advance. Uh, so, yeah, everybody is scheduled to come and no 1 just walks in to volunteer, especially, after, you know, since COVID. And people love their hours and they like their job. You know, they get something to do. They feel good about themselves. And they do it all the time and they do it. Well, we have probably the best volunteers you can even imagine. I mean, during COVID, when a lot of our volunteers couldn't come in, um, the YMCA provided some volunteers. Um, some of the employees that were home for those nine weeks um, actually came and volunteered in the office. Um, but volunteers have to be scheduled in that office. Because we have too many programs going on that if we didn't have if we didn't have the volunteers um, coming in, we'd have we'd have to find someone to come in. We, we could not run it all on staff. We just couldn't. Janet, do you want to explain? We depend on them. Do you want to explain to the board the new initiative that we're putting in place? Yes, yes, yes. So we, we put in for a, um, a full time position. And I think it's very important because we do get a lot of money. We're able to pay rents and mortgages and do all these things um, through grants or, or raising money or different organizations. The problem is there's a lot of statistics and a lot of reports, and those are all done by volunteers. And I think it's important, they have been after me for a while that we really need to get a staff person. This, this position is too important. Um, we're talking, you know, the money we wouldn't get if they weren't done. Um, also, you know, just being this relocation act, I it became a full time job for 3 or 4 weeks. So, having somebody to just. Take some of the, the pressure and do some of the work is would just be incredible. Um, our secretary slash receptionist at the front desk, we couldn't run without that person. And those are, um. We have 10 different volunteers four hours, 4 hours in the afternoon. We don't have a staff there and if that person doesn't come in. A staff has to go there and you. We, it's very difficult because we have so many other things going on in the office. Um, we get calls, um, we have to go to hotels to meet with people. We, we, um, during this winter, we put up 3 or 4 people that couldn't get shelters into motels. We had to make sure they got food. Um, it's, it's just. You don't know when you're going to be called out at night or in the weekend or on the weekend. Um. We just really need to depend knowing we have somebody there with this other person. I don't think 
I think our office would be in wonderful shape. And just just for clarification, um, as as Janet mentioned, we have a, a 14 hour uh, position currently under the uh, temporary seasonal. Uh, the plan is to uh, make a 35 hour position known as the community service aid. And uh, we we reduced a little bit the temporary service as a small set. Um, but the plan is to put the uh, put an aid position in for fifty three thousand seven hundred eight dollars and take a small reduction off the temporary seasonal because that 14 uh, hour temporary seasonal would now become a 35 hour town employee. Um, anything else you want to add on that part, Janet? No, I, 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 that's wonderful. I think you're on mute, Tony. Um, I see you talking. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. Just a, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Janet, a quick question. So, um, so the position is driven by both extra quote work activities as, as well as volume. It is, but you know, I think it's hard to have volunteers doing this work. Okay. Um, they run, there's a lot of work that's being done by volunteers and I think getting a lot of that work off of them. And when they leave, and we have two volunteers that have been there for a long time, and they're getting ready to leave, we're going to have problems. And we're just trying to prevent this from happening. This would be, these are jobs that should be done by an employee, these particular jobs. And the volume right now with COVID, the people that um, are having problems is increasing. The people that need food is increasing. Um, just to have somebody to make sure there's always a, um, a paid employee in the food pantry. That's going to be incredible. We've never had that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's okay. important to the uh, important to the community. Well, I, yeah, I thanks. Agree. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree on, on this position here because you definitely need somebody with everything going on. These new uh, initiatives that's going on, um, you got to have somebody to cover that. You can't just three staff members, full-time staff members, 35 hour people, you definitely need this new initiative to uh, get this done properly. There's uh, plenty of work done. I've been there many times uh, and it's a very, very well-run operation, but it's also a very, very, very busy operation. Yeah, it's a good point, Mr. Pocock. I, I you know, philosophically, I like the idea of people from the community providing the actual donations uh, and and I'm comfortable with the town or the taxpayers providing some infrastructure and some support on the top. So we're not taking taxpayer dollars and handing them out. We're taking taxpayer dollars merely to administer the function, but it's, it's food coming in from all over and supplies coming in from all over and volunteers coming in to, to assist that's the real beauty of of the operation, and I, you know, from a, a fiscal perspective, I, I I like that. I think it's a good balance, and I too support, you know, the the right level of staff to provide the administration. I, I Mr. Chairman, I also support it, but also I don't want to downgrade anything these volunteers because these they're a very dedicated uh, group of volunteers uh, from the community there. I mean, it, but this is just a different. Different area that really needs straight attention for for that period of time. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with I agree with that. I support the uh, new position being done by volunteers because volunteers, by nature, they don't have to come in, right? And it's just it's just difficult. You need a full time a person that's going to come every day, and that's like your main person to do the position. So oh, there are times if, if they call in that morning, it becomes very, very difficult for us. You know, we always manage. We're always going to manage. Um, and like I said before, our office is almost like three different departments. The food pantry is almost a department. Um, housing between relocation, evictions, foreclosures, um, fixing something um, so that they don't lose their home. Um, inside that's almost a full time and then just all the services we provide um, and i think so we know that no one could be evicted um and that's going to end pretty soon and also with your eversource 
they haven't been able to shut off anybody's power. So I'm thinking in two or three months, it is going to be probably one of the busiest offices in the town. Yeah, and it's going to be that for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Janet. What what, what you foresaw? <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. And I just you know, and we thank you. so during this oh COVID another interesting thing. So a councilman, um, councilman Shapinsky actually put a um, uh, the people are able to charge online. So um, the donations actually increased because we weren't able to do you know some of our fundraising and so because of that we're we're in good shape so if someone comes in and needs assistance we're ready even the food in the food pantry that's not purchased through the town either so um it really is a good system you know you're, you're not taking the taxpayer money and doing that you're you're but the taxes taxpayers are you know making sure that department is is able to run Janet, how's the van running? I remember my first uh, first big thing back in 2000, uh, I think it was, oh boy, I don't remember, 2010 budget, uh, getting a new van because the other one you could see through through the floor to the ground and the water would splash in on the driver. And I remember yeah, I was so proud when we bought a, not just a used one, but a brand new one. But now I'm thinking, uh, you know, it's, it might be getting old. Oh, so I, so. I'm preparing for that. I'm, we're trying to get friends to be able to pay half to three quarters if, of the van when we want one, when we need one, and then trying to approach the town. Um, so they're working on that now. But that other one is still holding up, huh? The one from 2010. Oh, it is. It is. It's holding up. Unbelievable. It, it's in good shape. But there, we're preparing so when it does happen, um, maybe they'll even have enough to pay for the whole. Um, vehicle, so that's what they're working on. Now. Um, recently, our 1 of our commercial freezers and refrigerators just broke down. We had to replace both of them in a 2 week period. And because of the main street foundation. They were paid for in full. What is 1 of what does 1 of them cost roughly? As they were, they weren't as bad as I thought. Um, so 1 was, um, 6,500. And the other was, I think, 1400. Oh. It's nice to have dedicated volunteers and organizations that step in to help. Oh, uh, anybody else have any other questions? Janet, thank you. Thank you for all you thank do. You. Make sure you thank your volunteers and your staff and um, tell them that we know. Things are going to get busy and, and COVID is, is putting an impact on them and give them an extra thank you from uh, your board of finance. I absolutely will. Thank you. Okay, uh, next next up, it's it's 739 now. We're running ahead of schedule, which is pretty good. About 20 minutes ahead of schedule. Just want to check with the chief daily and see if um, police department is ready or um, because we are we're originally scheduled for eight o'clock and we're early. We're ready. Please ready, Mr. Chairman. I can call nine one one and uh, <laughs> you know, if I had to, but I think I use the Zoom or I use the WebEx. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief, and, um, and we'll turn it over over to you to tell thank us you. about about your budget and if you want to share anything. Amelia, do you have the presentation? If we have to put it, we're going to put it up. So I just make them a co-host so they can uh, put their own information up and share it. Okay, Chief, however you want to proceed. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the Deputy Chief. I'd like to thank the Chairman, uh, Tim Verderam, for sitting in on this. Too. He, he's in the meeting. So turn it over to Deputy Chief Palmer, All right. All right. Well, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chairman Verderam. And Deputy Chief Palmieri, it's all yours. Good evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Because, uh, on behalf of uh, the Board of Police Commissioners, Chief Daly and myself, we'd first like to thank the men and women of uh, the Sunnyfield Police Department for their outstanding work during this pandemic. Um, but most importantly, we also want to thank the community. The support we have received um, from the community has been nothing short of outstanding, and it really goes uh, a long way uh, with our officers, 
when they're out there day in and day out doing the job. So uh, we want to make sure Chief Daly said to thank the community uh, for their support. Uh, so I want to cover how do we add value to the community. The Southern Southington Police Department adds value being a full service department. The police department responds and reviews all calls for service and attempts to provide service or guidance to the community, even if it's not a criminal matter. The foundation of a full service approach is to build trust and understanding within the community. When the community trusts the police department, we will be more effective overall in understanding the community needs and its expectations. And also we can deliver our services and be more effective as we try to enforce the laws of the state and the ordinances of the town. The approach also provides an initial review of an incident question or concern and reduces the chances of a non-criminal related matter to escalate into a criminal matter. We have department members that serve on many committees or groups within the town, which allows the community to see a police officer in a different light um, and from a different perspective. One example is recently our virtual neighborhood watch groups um, that wanted to help the community. Uh, Chris Laporte did an outstanding job uh, developing a training program and setting up guidelines and working with them uh, and collaborating on uh, this program has been very beneficial. When we look at current initiatives being discontinued, um, we kind of have a different take on it. Uh, we consistently review all our services and we don't run a service or a program every year just for the sake of running it. We kind of refer to it as a menu approach. Um, so we, we provide a, a variety of programs as requested or uh, as needed based on things that we're seeing within the community. When we look at initiatives being uh, innovative or being considered, uh, we're looking to increase our social media fit footprint and the information we can share with the community. We recently added a section on our website that allows the community to see um, the extent of vehicle burglaries and uh, motor vehicle thefts. We want to uh, increase the new information we're pushing out because uh, we believe the more the community understands what we're doing, the better we can work together to increase the quality of life in the town of Southern. Uh, we're exploring uh, a community survey. This will allow us to ask for feedback on not only how are we doing our job, but what services are truly important into the community and how can we meet those needs. We're also looking at town hall type meetings to allow community members to come and discuss their concerns or problems with members of the police department. Uh, the chief wants us to look at hosting these once we get through the pandemic, but also having them uh, mobile so we can go out to different groups or different locations and present kind of an overview of this is what the police department does. Um, in response to the pandemic, we were also looking at uh, the option of online reporting low level incidents or crimes, because sometimes a person will have a low level incident or crime they want to report to the police. They can't, they're, they're on their way to work or whatever, whatever. there's a way that uh, there's systems out there that will allow us to, uh, them to report it online and then we can address it from there. Um, We'd also like to increase our ability to process uh, records requests electronically. When the pandemic hit, um, our IT people set up a distribution group, which allowed the general public to request records, and then we would PDF them and mail them out. But we still don't have a way electronically to um, collect money. So we want to look at that and, and see, is it worth it? I know there's a fee charge, but we've been talking amongst ourselves. And we think some people may pay a two or, two or three percent fee just so they don't have to come to the police department to get the document. Um, so that's kind of where we stand there. Um, and I'll go through the budget if you want. We can leave our future considerations for, for last if, uh, if that's okay with the with the board. That's okay. I think we still want to hear hear them, but you could you could save them. Do you want us to put the presentation up or are you doing that? No, we're actually just going to talk through it, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, everybody received it. So if you want to open it, uh, was in the email. So if I could, with your permission, I was wondering if we could take them smallest to largest, starting with the emergency management budget. Okay, just give give me a minute. We're trying to trying to open it. Yeah, do it on my phone. I can put it up. Um, let me see. Yes. 
right. Does the board want to want to want to put it up? Work. I mean, can you put it up, John? Can you share? I can't. I have it on. Um, I don't have my town email on my on the computer I'm on. Uh, so I can't if somebody else can. Amelia, do you have it? You're on mute. You're on mute. It was a six megabyte file. It's a big file. DC, why don't you start going through the uh, uh, through the smaller ones, and then uh, we'll see what we can do from there. Okay. Right, so if we start on emergency management, which is page fifty one to fifty two on the, the manager's budget, um, that comes to the board with a uh, zero percent increase. We believe we can continue to support the services in that uh, budget as is. There are any questions on that? What's the, uh, is that absentee ballot line? Is that the right thing there? What is that? Uh, Amelia, you want to handle that part of it? Um, this 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 uh, budget section was used for a couple of things. Amelia, you want to talk about that? The emergency management line. You got to have to unmute yourself, please. Amelia. I was looking for the other file. Um, basically, the emergency management uh, department we used. Um, now that I can find the page. Fifty one. 51. Sure. Okay, so basically we accumulated um, all the funds that, that we had spent um, in, in this in this department so that we could keep everything together. Um, and we have received uh, monies from the state, I think it was. Um, so Normally, we use emergency management for three lines only, um, which would be the vehicle maintenance program supplies and the command vehicle connectivity. Um, but, but due to the um, absentee ballot situation and the COVID pandemic, um, we just we used this department to um, to incorporate all the expenses uh, pertaining to the to the. Uh, pandemic so that we could request reimbursement. So uh, the absentee ballot money uh, was received, it was a grant received um, obviously for the town clerk and the um, elections department. So the yeah. chief is only gonna focus in on those same three lines that we're used yeah. to seeing, right? right. The vehicles right. and okay, got it. There's special lines uh, strictly for last year and this year, and you can see the absentee ballot one was for for um, current year. I'm sorry, it's for current year, and and um, we don't have those line items in next year. You'll see, you'll see for the tw tw 2022 budget, we only have vehicle maintenance, program supplies, and a command vehicle connectivity. Yep, DC's got it up on the screen now. Yep. Yeah, that's good. We didn't want the, the chief out working on absent ballots. No, no. Although he would be the current. Okay. Let's we'll carry on, uh, Chief and Deputy Chief. Okay, the next one is the safety budget. And again, that's coming in with a uh, zero percent increase. Um, we believe that we can continue to do our services with our uh, traffic lights and our paving uh, as needed. They maintain the same price as they did last year. So, so uh, we're seeking no increase. Any questions on the safety budget?
Okay, Central Dispatch. That's the next budget that's, that's coming in at a 1.1% increase. Um, the big driver there is we're looking to um, increase $15,000 in overtime. Um, and that's basically generated from uh, a couple budgets ago, we were trying to get uh, a lead dispatcher to try it and utilize um, the overtime, uh, see how that works and then move forward on it. We haven't been able to do that um, because of vacancies and other unforeseen events. Uh, so we haven't added to the 110 that we brought it to when we did that. Um, the extra additional monies is so we can cover the vacancy between 645 and 1445 um, in the morning. We generally have 100% uh, replacement with the exception of those hours. Um, but we looked at calls for service uh, as far as what dispatch is handling with the phone calls. Um, and if you see over here, uh, we looked at the time period between 7 and 11 and 7 and 11 p.m. versus 7 11 a.m. Um, and day shift is getting more activity um, during that time um, for phone calls and processing uh, different calls for service. It's the same with our 911 calls. Uh, we're getting a little bit more calls for service during that time. And the way our dispatch is structured, we have 12 dispatchers spread out over three shifts, and we don't allow everyone to have a day off. We only allow one person a day off, whether it be a vacation day or a personal day. Uh, so it's not that everybody gets the day off, but we, uh, we'd like to start filling that, uh, that vacancy, and that's what the request is for, the additional $5,000 or so. Questions on that? Yeah, uh, just 2020 for the 911. So it's yep. it's 3030 and 2719. In year it's about 5700 911 calls. So just during that time period. You'll get the 911 calls in 2019 between 7 a.m. And 11 a.m. We received 3,030 911 calls, and between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. we received 2,719. We probably do between 12, 5, and 13,000 calls during the year for 911s. Okay, wow. And the trouble is the dispatchers they do uh, they do a lot of things. They're, you know they they do EMD. They answer the radio. Uh, you know, they enter warrants, and so they're, they're doing all sorts of stuff, and um, that's just showing that the activity is is more, is actually more frequency during uh, the morning hours than it is at night. Okay, animal control. Animal control is coming in at a .50 percent increase basically everything is staying the same there's a little increase in uh, the regular wage line um, there's a reduction in building maintenance that's based on the manager's plan and there was an increase in the transfer to self-insurance any questions on that All right. There it is, the police budget. Oh, it should happen. It's a big one. It probably takes a little while to load. I think it was a six megabyte file when I tried to open it. It's a big file. Should load though. It's here. Maybe it's just time to load. <coughs> I'll go to it. We'll go to it in the book just to. 
in the book, page 43. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Police budgets coming in at a 1.93% increase. Um, and the main the main drivers in that are uh, the, the police accountability bill uh, with overtime. Uh, just go through them in the order of the budget line. Um, Fifty thousand uh, dollars in overtime would cover the police accountability bill. Uh, they're requiring now officers be drug tested uh, prior to their certification and the. It, we're on a three year cycle. So by June 30th, every three years, we have to complete 60 hours of tra uh, training to keep our certification. And what they're doing with the, um, the police accountability bill was they added in that we have to go uh, for a drug test, whatever, whoever, all officers who are expiring on June 30th of that year have to have a drug test uh, to include the anabolic steroids. So we projected that's going to cost us. Uh, roughly $3,700 in overtime. Uh, the program cost will be $5,850 uh, to administer uh, roughly 26 to 29 tests a year. That's how. That's roughly what our our certification is. They also included uh, every five years, um, an officer has to have a behavioral health assessment. So that works out to about 16 officers per year. So that the assessments caught is projected to cost $4,800 and the overtime associated with that will be about uh, $2,300. So that's here. And this is all brand new stuff. These are all brand new requirements. Yes. Yep. They're all brand new requirements. Um, they're also mandating the crowd management uh, training and policy. Um, to come into effect. So we believe that in overtime will be about a $25,000 venture because it'll probably be an eight hour class. Um, we're looking at about 55 or 56 officers because we figure if it is an eight hour class, some of the officers could go uh, train while they're on duty, like our, our admin people, uh, myself, the chief, uh, you know, our detectives will be able to, to shuffle them around. Uh, where we can not use overtime, but use um, use their work time to make that accomplish. Um, and then associated with the crowd management training is um, us to get crowd management equipment. Um, once we train to this, we currently don't have any uh, civil disturbance equipment. So this sixteen thousand. Uh, 350 would come with meet the uh, program supplies, and that would allow us um, to purchase equipment for our response to uh, tests uh, or civil unrest. And then they're also in the process, and it was in the paper, uh, the use of force, uh, the changes in our policy and our training. Uh, we estimate that to be about 12,500. Two dollars to implement. They are changing uh, the way we utilize um, force uh, in our job, and we're, we're in the process of waiting for Post to come out with their model model policy. We have an officer on the board 
uh, or the committee, I should say, that's looking at uh, the training uh, that's going to be needed for the support exchange. So that totals $56,041, and we're looking to increase the overtime by, by 50 and see where we can uh, try and manage uh, those new legislative actions. Is this legislative action going to, this is a question for the chief. Is this legislative action, how much is it going to help us on a scale of one to 10, bring us from where we are to a, or scale of one to five, from where we are to a better place? Is it extremely effective, somewhat effective? This is going to be terrific. Where, where, I would I would guesstimate uh, probably a negative three. Uh, it's just totally changing the way teaching is done. And there's too many unanswered questions right now. So we oppose some of these changes. We tried working with the uh, legislature to ask if we could uh, have input uh, from the Connecticut Police Chief. That, uh, this was passed um, without our uh, support because there's there's areas and that need to be adjusted. That would be my answer. All right. So this is um, more because the pendulum swung kind of reaction rather than a necessity that's born within the police departments doing a self assessment and thinking what's needed. Right. I, I didn't want to interrupt. I did want to ask the question, but I don't want to break up, break the flow of the presentation. Yeah, just um, can I just add, add, add a question to that, Mr. Chairman? Um, Please. Just uh, the operational costs uh, will uh, will happen every year, uh, I assume. Uh, if you could talk to that, and and the capital costs, uh, once we've supplied all the cameras needed, um, those you know th th those would go away. Is is that correct? The, well, the operational costs, if we look at the, if you look at the drug testing and yeah. the behavioral health assessments, those will be static. Those really aren't going to change. Okay. Um, when we look at the crowd management training, which is the big $25,000 item, um, we believe that we can probably reduce that in half because once we have the initial training, um, it's similar to what we did this budget cycle when we had some unfortunate events occur in the United States, we brought some specialists in to increase our training in certain areas. So initially it was a 12 hour uh, program, but now we're looking to maintain it with four hours moving forward. So the crowd management and the use of force, the initial changes, yes, we're looking at it to be uh, a four hour block minimum for use of force for each officer at eight. But then after that, we're probably looking at a two hour block uh, every year just to keep it consistent. So uh, when we look at the implicit bias um, and the crowd management, uh, pilot training, and the use of force, we probably can cut those numbers in half at the next uh, next budget cycle, unless the legislative group mandates a certain amount of training. Like sometimes they'll come out like for human trafficking, they pass legislation where they say every year you have to have two hours of human trafficking. So that's a requirement. So uh, that's a little bit on the on the gray area, uh, but we believe there may be some uh, there may be some room um, there to reduce costs. And even the capital items, um, like if you look at the dash cameras, um, that that one ninety one three thirty seven gets us uh, five years, roughly five years out into the future. We won't have to address that. The eighty six zero five five. It's going to grab us two more years because we're currently in a five-year program with our existing body cameras. So we'll probably be looking at um, a, a body camera changeover in two more budgets. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, this um, just piggybacking on what on 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 what the chief said, because um, <laughs> I understand you you do training in these areas, or you did in a certain way. Uh, what the chief said, just to underline that, you are asked to be doing training in a different way. Uh, is that a correct statement? That's exactly it. That's why currently, if you saw it, it was on TV last night, the Connecticut police chiefs were trying to get the bill pushed out 
right. uh, the use of force changes. It's supposed to be enacted April 1st of 2021. They're trying to get it pushed out to uh, October 1st of 2022 to give, uh, there's eight to 9,000 officers in the state of Connecticut. They're trying to give time so that we can retrain all our officers in this totally changed way they have to implement use of force. And it's just a totally different way of doing business for police officers in the state. And Okay, uh, can, I ask, can I ask a favor? Could you send just this page? Like John, I, I had trouble opening it. Um, and it's a good summary of everything in the budget that's, that, that's connected to this bill. <coughs> it's, it's a really good summary of one page. If you could just send the page to us all, I, I'd really appreciate that. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you very much. It's it's kind of eye opening. <laughs> I mean, it just uh, just the, the thought. Imagine multiplying this by 169 towns. Obviously, not all towns are as big as Southington, but that's uh, it's 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 an impact. Okay. And I, I, we don't know if they they understood fully what they were the impact having on communities. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, you know, and I'm trying, I'm just trying to focus just on the budget, not the behind the scenes politics. But if, if you asked, if you said to the departments, um, you're going to have about, uh, say, 300000 to play with or 150000 extra money to make some enhancements in the way you do things, I would just reckon that every department would be so excited and they would sit down, talk to everybody, and put that money to good use, and they know where their soft spots are, and they would they would, you know, do some internal collaboration and discussions and come out with a good plan rather than have one, you know, just be dealt down with such a high cost. It's it's doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a complete unfunded mandate by the state that we had no control over. And we and we had no input in it, and that's that's a bigger problem. I mean, when when something happens, instead of looking at what were the underlying factors to make it happen, they just painted everybody with a broad brush, um, and that's that in lies the problem that we're having right now. Is there was no input from uh, the police professionals because we all want to do the best job we can for our communities, but uh, you had sweeping change, and uh, you, you never even asked us, you know. What input do we have? How can we make things better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So moving on to uh, program supplies. Uh, part of the increase, as I said before, were the uh, the crowd the, uh, crowd management gear. Uh, we also have sixty seven hundred dollars in uh, taser cartridges. Are fifty two hundred dollars. Uh, that's part of our less lethal option program. Um, and we transitioned this year uh, to a sock round option, which would be $1,500 for, uh, for sock rounds each year uh, to train our officers with. Um, we haven't had to get uh, taser cartridges in a while because we had a, uh, a sister PD that had a, a surplus they gave to us when we lasted uh, a few years, but we are out of them now as far as training goes. Uh, so now we need to put them into the budget. We look at um, the new vehicles is next. Uh, there's a, a slight increase um, to that line. Uh, the big driver is we're still we're, we're still catching up with them changing the uh, new the new designs because none of our equipment fits. Uh, but we also uh, every year we try to trade in four four vehicles and then we use uh, that goes into the changeovers and everything else. What we did last year um, was we kept the car. We, we kept the car. Um, we want to keep a car back. We actually purchased the car uh, for private duty jobs, so we don't have to continue to use our fleet. So instead of, tur of turning in four cars this year, uh, we want to tra trade in three, and we're going to take the best of our cars that are being moved and moved it into private duty. So when we're out there on private duty assignments, uh, we're not using our line cars which should extend the, the maintenance and uh, life expectancy of those cars. I mean, in, in 1920 fiscal year, um, private duty vehicles generated uh, 
$222,000 for the town. Uh, so we look at this, although it increases our, our budget line for vehicles, we think taking that car and adding the 3,500 to the budget, if we able to put that car out each year, it's gonna pay bigger dividends that way for us and have us, uh, our fleet will be better off. And so that car, that car uh, Deputy Chief, that car is just uh, used for lights for, you know, just for uh, standing by on a road road job or something? Yeah, it could be if we had a block off a road, road job, stuff like that. Instead of taking, instead of taking a, we have four, four cars now that we do that. We just like to increase that because if we have more than four jobs, then we're doing line cars. So this is just a way for us to kind of hopefully reduce maintenance. And that's that is it for the the police budget. Okay. Um, yeah, I I would like to say um, you know coming in at. 1.9% is 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 pretty good. I was actually expecting more, uh, but I guess a lot of the additional police accountability costs are on uh, are on the capital side. Uh, but to come in at um, you know uh, close to inflation, I, I think in these times is 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 really good. Um, secondly, Tony, if I may, just the, the chief sorry. did a good job. But just remember. Uh, all the salary increases are in another part of the budget. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, because I was going to ask about that. I was going to no, say this is... <laughs> I, 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 I know that the chiefs would not want me to say that, but yes, no, they're very... <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, 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 the increase will be a little bit more than what you see. Okay, in a okay. Yeah. okay. I wondered, I wondered uh, where, where the other shoe would drop. But um, um, how, the, we, we added two police officers last year. Um, how is that... Uh, it, well, how is that being used, uh, particularly as it seems rather um, a prescient re request <laughs> because of uh, you know, uh, the crime wave we've been enjoying recently? So could, if, you could, if you could ask, if you could tell us how, how, you know, how that's worked out, that'd be great. Yeah, one of the, well, one of the officers that we hired, we hired one in July, and by the time they get on the road, you probably get on the road um, by September, October. Uh, the second officer was hired in January, and he's still in field training right now, so he's had oh, okay. no impact. And okay. since then, we've lost uh, an officer that got deployed to the military for the next year. So it's it's just an unending cycle. It's not like we've gotten a whole bunch of additional officers. Uh, that's why we supplement as needed with overtime. We have a great working relationship with the town manager. Uh, we keep uh, him up to date. Our Board of Police Commissioners is constantly watching over us to make sure um, we're staying within budget, but also we keep them updated as we as our needs increase. Um, so right now, they, there hasn't been a huge impact of additional personnel. Um, yes, we got two officers, but like I said, uh, one is still in training. Understood. Understood. Chief, on, on the overtime line, when I look back at 2019 and see like 473, 2020 year, 554, uh, does that, do the actuals there include the transfers back from the salary line to, to overtime? Or was that the kind of the budgeted amounts? Um, because when I look at 2021, Projection is 592, but the new budget going in is 425. It would appear to be like 167,000 short. Yeah. What what we normally do is our salary line, we transfer out of that line into the overtime line. Um, there for various reasons. When someone's out injured um, and their salary is reduced and it, it's paid out of um, Workers comp uh, that reduces the salary line, so we'll transfer it into the overtime line. When we when we have a vacancy, sometimes it takes months and months to uh, fill the vacancy. By the time we do the background and get them hired, we have a vacancy there, so there's extra money. We over these years, what we've done is 
Um, we keep very good track of what our budget is. So we know how much extra money we're going to have in the salary line and we transfer it over to cover the shortfall in the overtime line. That's the best. Uh, okay. No, it, I guess that kind of makes sense with what we've seen in the past. So then I would, you know, if I were predicting, I would predict about 150,000 or so will have to find its way from the salary line to the overtime line or else we're going to have to uh, um, have an issue there. Right. We just transferred the last finance meeting. We transferred a considerable amount from salary into overtime. And we just keep an eye on it and we transfer as needed. Okay. Thank you, Chief. But we fully fund, each year we fully fund the salary line and then transfer as needed. Yeah, I knew that. And that was because you have to, right? That's just the... You gotta, you gotta plan for everybody being in their position. There. So that's what the town manager and Amelia require. So that's what we do. Okay. Any other questions? Do you see um, additional overtime or or any additional requests coming up for strategies regarding? All the car break ins. I mean, that's what we hear a lot about on the social media and the press. You know, it's all the, the car break ins, the thing, the, the theft. Do we, you know, do we think that that's going to, you know, come back to us in the form of a, an appropriation or, or a need or something, or is it all built in here? Um, we continuously reevaluate the overtime line. So, and as we need it, we just had an officer was making an arrest, broke his hand, he's getting operated on tomorrow. So there's continuous that we reevaluate, depends on who gets hurt, who's out sick. Um, it's a day, we do it every week, we reevaluate what we need. And uh, if we have to pay overtime, that's uh, sometimes that's the avenue we use versus asking for additional personnel. Depends if it's a temporary, Bill, or if it's a long term thing that we're dealing with. So, like I said, we, we have a great relationship with the town manager and the board of police commissioners. So, we work together to get the job done. Okay. Thank you. Any, any more questions for the police department? No, this is Kevin Jack. Uh, Thanks for coming again with a great budget. 10 years since I've been on the board, uh, board of finance where you come in every year with a, with a very good budget. I'm in my even though stuff are, and even though, like Mark said, the salaries are in another category. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> 19 years I've been doing this. And you know, I gotta, I say it with a little, a little just, but, but in all truth, I mean, this hasn't been a good year for statues. It hasn't been a good year for, for police officers in the, you know, in the way, you know, the things have, have transpired in the country. So make sure that our, our police officers here in Southington know that we appreciate them. Um, we feel for them when they get hurt or when they, you know, have to go out and deal with things that we uh, wish don't even happen. The um, stuff that you guys see, you women, men and women that you see, that you deal with, you see people sometimes at their worst of times, uh, and um, and sometimes those situations get very difficult. You deal with it, we don't, and and we sometimes again we don't even almost don't want to know the detail. Read something in the paper, and you 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 shake your head, um, just knowing that you know there are people out there doing terrible things, and you guys have to be on the front lines of that. So please let everybody know that. Our board of finance here in Southington appreciates you and uh, we'll do everything we can to support you in any way you can. And we know that you're trying to do your very, very best to, uh, I guess, protect and serve. And, and we realize that. So I think thank you. I will say that I believe and our officers know that they are fully supported by the citizens of Southington, the administration of Southington, the town of Southington, the Southington Police Department, and all the uh, council 
police commission, all the commissions, they know that they're supported. And that is one of the benefits of working for the town of Southington, I will say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thanks very much. Our next workshop is tomorrow night at 630. It looks like we finished a little bit early, but we thank everybody. It looks like we had some good content. Um, there was one more police thing, though. Was there something we always said we're going to save a, a, the wish list item or something you wished was in the budget and isn't? Uh, we always like to hear that. Not that we, you know, sometimes we can't work magic, but we just like to know what we're leaving on the table at times. Jack, are you to talk about the town jet that you and I have been talking about? The, uh, <laughs> the <Walmart? laughs> town jet? We downsized it to a helicopter. Okay, all right. And we'll probably end up with a drone, right? <laughs> if Mark has his way, it'll be a paper airplane. That he'll <laughs> so, I mean, actually, uh, to echo what the chief said, I mean, we have a good relationship uh, with the town manager and the town council, the board of finance. Uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of coming to you with our future consideration is more of more of a, a way we, we're going to examine how we do business because uh, you know policing is going to change and like we tell our officers it's still one of the most admirable jobs uh, anybody can get involved in and we have to sit down now and look and, and more than ever we're going to have to be involved with the community so uh, the chief myself and uh, members of the command staff we're going to take this this year moving forward and really look at you know, how do we shore up our relationships with the community? And that doesn't mean going soft on crime because the more the community trusts us, the better off they're willing to talk to us and the more effective a police officer would be. I mean, if we can all remember back in the day when we had, you know, Oxleys on the corner and you had Serafinos with their little cap, you know, little dinette, and we had, uh, well, it was Lieutenant Pocock, but Officer Pocock would be there having a sandwich and people were talking and you knew everything and everybody got done. And that's what we have to get back to. So that's what we're going to look at. We know that if we need more personnel, um, we'll be able to come forward and we'll make a case uh, for that. But right now we really want to get a handle on um, where where policing is going and where do we need to focus our energy. Um, and hopefully within the next year, that's going to be uh, through conversation with our legislators and just trying to improve on some of the things uh, that they put in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Everything good? Yep. yep. Nice. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, have a good Bye. night, guys. Bye. See you tomorrow.